Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. We are recording this on Friday, September 14th, 2023. In this week's episode, an obsessed man faces murder charges for the death of his ex-girlfriend, a high-profile Hollywood sex therapist, in a case where prosecutors allege he broke into her home, strangled her, and eventually threw her over a third-story balcony to her death. In other news, attorneys hammer out the issue of whether or not to allow cameras in the courtroom for the highly anticipated murder trial of Brian Koberger, the man accused of slaying four University of Idaho students. But first, an appeals court is now considering the case of actor Jesse Smollett following his conviction for staging a hate crime and a hoax that made national headlines. Today, we are excited to be joined by Bob Mata, a criminal defense attorney and legal analyst. Bob is also the host of Defense Diaries, a true crime podcast you can listen to wherever you get your podcast. Bob, welcome back. Thanks, Joshua. I'm thrilled to be back. Had a good well, time last time. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. And for those listeners who didn't get a chance to hear you the first time around, tell us a little bit about your, your practice. What have you been up to lately? Uh, so long time criminal defense guy, uh, 20 plus years, trial lawyer, always been on the defense side of things. Uh, my father was a defense attorney, so I come from a very short line of defense attorneys. Uh, did that for, for a long time. Uh, a couple years back, I decided uh, my wife, who is my law partner and a pit bull defense attorney herself, uh, was kind enough to let me step out of the practice and start a podcast, which I did because I told her, look, I'm going to go all in on this thing. I can't go half on it because uh, then I won't succeed. There's just too much competition out there. So she let me do that. So I've been doing the pod for a couple of years and it's taken off and I'm excited about it. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, man. It is taking off. It's getting a lot of popularity. I see it pop up all the time. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the commentary and notes that you have both on the podcast and uh, when I catch you on TV, you always have a very interesting take. So we're excited to have you on today. Thank you again excited for coming on. I appreciate that. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to teach the people one at a time that defense attorneys aren't scumbags. You know? it's, and it's, <laughs> Good. A it's a tough job, man. Good luck with that. It's yeah. an uphill battle. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Well, let's see if we can't uh, disabuse some people of those uh, preconceptions today um, on talking about these cases. Uh, we'll jump right in. First out of Chicago, Illinois, the never-ending legal saga of former Empire star Jesse Smollett continues as a Illinois Supreme Court hears arguments from the actor's attorney seeking to overturn his conviction. Smollett was convicted of staging a racist and homophobic attack against himself, hiring two Nigerian actors to assault him wearing ski masks, even instructing them to shout, this is MAGA country, that's a quote. The case became a lightning rod for racial tensions at the time, with celebrities and politicians quickly rushing to support Smollett publicly. Defense attorneys for Smollett argue that his 2021 conviction should be thrown out on the basis that the actor should not have been punished twice for the same crime. In 2019, Smollett reportedly reached an agreement with prosecutors to drop charges against him in exchange for a $10,000 bond and community service. However, in 2020, a special prosecutor was appointed to the case, which led to a trial and Smollett's eventual conviction. Smollett was subsequently sentenced to 150 days jail time to be followed by 30 months of felony probation. He was also ordered to pay over $120,000 in restitution to the city of Chicago, along with a $25,000 fine. A three-judge panel will now consider Smollett's appeal. If the appeal is unsuccessful, the actor will be required to finish out his 150-day jail sentence. All right, Bob, jump right in. We're talking about the Fifth Amendment here and double jeopardy. Could you first explain for listeners a little bit what what we're talking about as far as why this is a concern in this case? Well, the primary concern is because theoretically, at least, there was a disposition to the case. Now, it's unusual in the sense that the state made a plea offer 
but the plea offer was to drop the case with the attachment that there was going to be some penalties included. So like the community service and the fines. So in terms of this particular case, I find it fascinating because of that question of whether or not double jeopardy attaches, which if, if you guys don't know what it is out there, essentially, if you've gone to trial and you, it's been adjudicated fully, they're not able to come back at you. You, you know, I mean, double, double jeopardy attaches and, and they're done. And, and this case is interesting because of the fact that there wasn't really adjudication in the in the typical sense of the word. I mean, clearly there was an agreement between the state and between Samalat and his attorneys, and that agreement ended up resulting in them dro- like dropping the charges. So he didn't plead out. He did. He didn't have like in Illinois. And I'm a Chicago guy. We have things like they call supervision, which means you know you plead out to supervision. And, you know, they give you some parameters. You have to finish the the community service. You have to pay the fine. You know, maybe they send them some kind of counseling. And if you get those things done within the time frame, then what happens is then they drop the case. But there's still a disposition here that never happened. Like he never stood in front of a judge. A judge never admonished him. None of those things happened. So right now what they're arguing about, his defense is saying, look, like this is double jeopardy. We we had an agreement. He he paid the fine. He did the community service. He paid the penalty, despite the fact that there was not any kind of real adjudication, at least on record, in terms of the eyes of the court. So how it's going to shake out, man? I'm I'm really kind of fascinated to see. What what are your thoughts on it? No, I I completely agree with you. It this is not a small issue. I mean, this is not just one of those typical appeals that you see where they're just trying to throw a bunch of stuff against the wall, see what sticks. This this is a real question that they're going to have to figure out. And usually, double jeopardy, we call it double jeopardy attaches when a jury is sworn. So you you get 12 people, you've now picked them They immediately swear that jury and now double jeopardy attaches, meaning that whatever happens after that point, that is the prosecution's only bite at the apple. If their case falls apart, their case falls apart. There's nothing they can do about it. That's why, and I know listeners are wondering, well, then how do you get retrials on the same case? That's why when there is a retrial, when they can't reach a verdict because the jury is hung or for whatever other reason, the judge declares a mistrial essentially saying that trial did not occur, which solves the double jeopardy issue, the the idea of jeopardy attaching so that they can be retried again. So this is different and is fascinating because I don't believe that jeopardy ever really attached in the disposition that he arrived at, if you even want to call it a disposition. But you and I both know uh, plea agreements and diversions, we call them here in California, Uh, You have the same mechanism, it sounds like, in Illinois, where there's an an understanding that if they do certain obligations, community service, pay some fines, whatever else that the prosecution is asking, that they will dismiss their case. But it almost sounds like what happened here was a step beneath that. And the, the, the prosecution in their argument is saying that this was not a plea agreement in that traditional sense, but it's a mechanism that they're calling, and maybe you know how to pronounce this better than I do, nolle prosecui, where- yeah, we just call them nolly pros out here. <laughs> nolly pros. Easier. Okay, no, yeah. okay, great. For Thank you for telling me that. So yeah. nolly pros, it, which my understanding of it is basically they're saying, we're not even going to prosecute. We're not, we're not even going to file charges- because he's done A, B, and C, and therefore we're not even going to go to the point of of getting a case in front of the court. Is that basically what they're saying took place, and why this should be treated differently? Yeah, when like typically, and it, it's still unusual. Like when typically I, I go in on cases, and say for instance, like a lot of times we get nolly process on uh, domestic violence cases where. You have that circumstance where it's a a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You go, you set it for for trial more quickly. Cooler heads prevail and or, uh, you know, the the actor like bullies the the other, the victim into, you know, not showing up to court. So often what happens is I'll go in if I'm defending the case and they can't get service on the victim. 
uh, they'll typically give them two or three continuances in order to try to get the victim served in order to to bring her into court if it's if it's a female in that situation if they can't get it done typically what they'll do is they'll nolly process it where it leaves them the opportunity to come back that that's the thing they can they can yeah. recharge the crime so and there's a difference when I was talking about supervision, supervision is, is one thing, but they also do have the same thing as you guys have out there with the diversion program. And it's the same thing. But but the difference in terms of, and I'm in Illinois. All right. So Kim Fox, who was the former prosecutor, who was the one who originally dropped the charges and the entire world's head was going to explode. Everyone right. was so upset about it. And, and she's the one who basically made this sweetheart deal. But typically out here. If I get my guy into a diversion program, like what they do is they go in and they plead it out. So there is, it, it is adjudicated. There is a disposition. You know what I'm saying? So they're pleading it out. They're staying it. And at that point, if he can finish the program, then it gets dropped. So what didn't, it's missing that crucial step here where where they they basically had him plead out either. And it's the same with supervision. In both situations, you're, you're pleading guilty but they're going to stay prosecution until the time to see if they can finish the program and finish whatever the, the requirements are under the plea deal. If they, if, if, if they can do it successfully, boom, it's gone. And it would be considered like in those cases, I would say that jeopardy attached here. I, I think it's a real uphill battle for Smollett's team, because I, I agree with you. I just don't think that they, they hit that necessary requirement for, anything of of note like I, I don't even know what the appellate court can hang their hat on in terms of saying okay well there was a disposition to this case well a back room disposition maybe a handshake yeah. deal but there's nothing on the record i mean what what is the appellate court going to look at in terms of trying to because they're they're bound by the record right so right. They're, they're they're gonna they're gonna be wondering well what are we basing this on because there is no record I'm curious to see how it's going to shake out, but it's it really is a fascinating issue, though. Yeah, and if there if there wasn't even a case filed, to me uh, to me there is no double jeopardy issue here. Um, right, but there might be some sort of almost contractual issue here because listen, there you know this this happens all the time where when you're plea bargaining you're essentially entering into a contract the prosecution says here's your offer if you'll do such and such and he accepts that we will do such and such meaning dismiss some of the charges have him plead to something lesser that you know nobody's signing pieces of paperwork sometimes they are but most of the time this is just kind of oral contracts that are taking place and i think there's an argument for Smollett, not to say that he's been tried sh twice for the same crime, but listen, you made me do something. You said, give you a $10,000 bond and do some community service and you wouldn't prosecute. And he did that. Right. Now, the only wiggle room here is, as far as my understanding in the moving papers, is that there wasn't that promise of we would not prosecute. There was just this idea that they would go in with that Nolly Pross which I, again, I guess if you're arguing on his behalf, you're like, well, then what was I doing it for? If it wasn't for a, a promise to not prosecute, what am I giving you $10,000 for and doing all this community service? So it may just come down to bad faith on the part of the prosecutor's office. Which yeah. happens. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and like you said, man, like a majority of the time when I'm working out a deal and whether it be with just strictly the prosecutors or if i'm working with law enforcement as well if i've got a guy that's interested in maybe working with law enforcement in order to kind of skate out of some you know type of charges that he had picked up or they had picked up it's not in writing <laughs> like right. ever they're never really, like i'm always asking for it in writing so that i have something to say okay this is what they wrote this is the agreement they're they're breaching it you know because without that it's it's he said she said or he said they said whatever the case may be yeah like in this situation i agree i, I don't think it's a double jeopardy issue at all um and i i don't think that there's going to be a record and frankly i don't know if there was anything put in writing so then right. we're talking about an oral contract and contractually 
how is that going to factor in when we're talking about a criminal sentence? You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like we're trying to we're trying to merge contract law and criminal law. It's it's a nutty case. It was crazy to begin with. It hasn't gotten any less crazy as it's no, been. no, it hasn't. And 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 I think you're right. Somewhere the 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 court of appeal or the Supreme Court there in Illinois is going to have to 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 clarify all of this and work their way through the muck to figure out what exactly took place. I, for one, though, am interested to see how they uh, decide on this. And I'm also interested in the day that we're no longer talking about Jesse Smollett. <laughs> I, it would be nice to just put this chapter behind us. You and me both. Th exactly. That and Murdoch. Murdoch. Exactly. I could, I'd, I'd like to put both of them in like a closet and like lock that closet never to open it again. But no such Looks luck. Like it's, no such luck. Look, looks no. like it's never going to happen. Anyhow, let's now turn to Los Angeles, where the trial for the slaying of a high-profile Hollywood sex therapist is underway on the infamous ninth floor of the downtown criminal court building here in Los Angeles, where Dr. Amy Harwick died in the hospital hours after she was found on the patio of her Hollywood Hills home, having suffered manual strangulation and a 20-foot drop from her third-floor balcony. Prosecutors allowed alleged that her former boyfriend, Gareth Pursehouse, broke into Harwick's home, lying in wait before attacking the therapist. Harwick and Pursehouse dated briefly before the doctor ended the relationship in 2012, eventually seeking protective orders against Pursehouse. A chance encounter in 2020 at an award show allegedly reignited Pursehouse's obsessive fixation on Harwick, which intensified in the month before her death. Defense attorneys for Purse House have alleged that the man fell into a deep depression following his encounter with Harwick before going to the doctor's house to seek a resolution. Purse House claims he only wanted to speak with Harwick, right, who attempted to escape him, ultimately falling to her death from her bedroom balcony in a terrible accident. Bob, um, from a legal perspective, this case presents, I think, an excellent opportunity to talk about the felony murder rule and then talk a little bit about how it's changed in California and how it might benefit the defendant in this case. But first, for listeners benefit, could you walk us through just kind of general understanding of what the felony murder rule is? Yeah, essentially kind of breaking it down in the simplest form is if in during the commission of a felony, so say you're going to rob a bank and your intent when you left the house was not to kill anybody but to go rob the bank so you can get the money and you get into the bank and you've got a feisty old security guard there and you're in the in the commission while you're actually robbing the bank the old security guard pulls out his gun and you take out your gun and he gets killed and you didn't even mean to shoot him say say you just shot up in the air and the bullet came down and went through the top of his skull without any intent. So your intent is not because that that's really what it boils down to. when we're talking about felony murder. That rule is that somebody gets killed during the commission of a crime without you intending on killing them. Now, that that rule used to be too bad. You were committing you were committing a felony. Somebody died during the commission of the felony. You're going down on felony murder. So because typically with murders, you know, Joshua, there's 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 got to be the intent, meaning that you had to intend on killing that person. So that's that's kind of like the bottom line. It's basically where if somebody in a lot of times where it happens are, are where you have multiple people, multiple actors where like the, the, the easiest way is like, look, we're going to Joshua and I are going to go rob a, a liquor store and he's going to be the getaway driver. I'm going to go in and uh, I'm going to do the robbery. He waits out there or he comes in with me, gets the money. I say, go get the car ready, pull it up. He's like, all right, goes out. I have beef with the, the cashier. I end up shooting and killing the cashier while Josh is quietly sitting in his vehicle, minding his own business, listening to some music, patiently waiting for me to come out. I jump into the car. I'm like, oh, man, I just killed that guy. Back in the old days, and it sounds like California, you guys, it's still that way in Illinois. Sounds like California, you guys changed your law there. Back in the old days, Joshua is going down on felony murder. He's because he was a participant in the crime. He's just as guilty as I was, even though he wasn't the shooter. So that's it's kind of how the, the rule works. Yeah, no, that was an excellent explanation of that. 
And just to add to that, so people aren't concerned as to, you know, why are we applying murder charges to somebody who didn't actually pull the trigger? The the idea behind it is it's not just any felony. I mean, we're not talking about tax evasion. We're talking about violent crimes. Like you said, armed robbery, uh, rape, residential burglary, these types of crimes where there's the, a high possibility of harm or even death to others. And so what the law decided was that we're going to substitute essentially the intent to kill for the intent to commit that felony because there's the understanding you participate in this type of ultra-violent, ultra-dangerous behavior. You can't then claim, you know, I'm so shocked that somebody ended up dead. In other words, to use your example, you know, I'm the getaway driver, but I know you're going into the liquor store with a gun. It, it's it's a very real possibility somebody could end up hurt or dead, and therefore I can't just claim, hey, all, all I was doing was driving the car. But you are correct to point out that they changed that in California. And right. California essentially... Um, gutted that to to a large extent and what they're now saying is that you have to you cannot just be the person sitting in the car you have to have actually intended to have committed the murder or been a major participant in that crime which leads to the question what is a major participant i have a, no idea i don't know right. if if california has even ultimately decided what that means but more importantly, how it applies to this case here is very interesting because he's committing a, a residential burglary. That's a felony. She ends up dead under the felony murder rule. They could just say, listen, if you find that he committed this felony and she ends up dead in the course of committing that felony, he's on the hook for premeditated murder, first degree murder. Here, his defense is making the argument it was all accidental and that could have a huge effect on this case, yes? Yes massive effect on this case and it's like this case is another one where you're just sitting there listening to the fact pattern and it's going to be so difficult for the state to prove that she didn't jump because basically the defense's theory is like look she was trying to get away from him and she like on her own accord jumped over the balcony because she thought she could survive the jump and didn't make it you know obviously the prosecution saying no that is not what happened he tossed her over he killed her this guy was obsessed with her, you know, and like they've been making the argument that the obsession started way before the little gala, you know, where where he ends up running back into her, that it's it's deep seated and long standing. So, you know, in terms of, of that concept applying where it could be argued, I, I mean, I think there's a valid argument for it, you know, in the sense that. I, I, yeah, it. It's going to be really interesting to see how that one shakes out. And and I had not thought of that concept until you brought it up to me in terms of how it's going to shake out ultimately in terms of are they just going to get them on the Resberg with the felony? You know, because if obviously if the jury finds that he tossed her over, it's moot, right? He's, right. he's going down right. on the murder. So the question then becomes, how is the statute going to apply? And like you said, when we're talking about major participant obviously that that seems to me to require at least two actors right so i don't think that's the issue but like the way that all new statutes end up getting fleshed out is through appeals like so right. when someone when someone gets convicted and obviously i know you know joshua but like when someone gets convicted on a new statute or a statute that, that's been amended and it, it hasn't been in, uh, up in to the appellate court, that's what lawyers do. Like we're sitting there arguing what, how, how the application should be applied. Like when the law, the new law, how that should be applied. And that's what the state and that's what the defense are arguing about. Like we'll often have very different ideas on how the law should apply. And this is gonna be one of those cases potentially where they're going to figure out how the amended statute is going to apply. But I think it's going to require, in order to get to that point, it's going to require him to get convicted. At least, I mean, I think he's done on the Rasberg, right? I mean, we could feel right. pretty confident. Well, I, in the not back. to interrupt you, but I think they've conceded that. They, right. They've said he was that. Yeah, he broke in. Yeah, he was there, but he never intended for her to end up dead and he never pushed her over and that's where they're finding a lot of wiggle room in this new change in the law 
Yeah, and it, it's it is a lot of wiggle room because back in the old days, he's done. Right. <laughs> you know now. No, I mean to to again not to interrupt you, but my last point on this was not only is it, I mean we're talking a vast difference because. There has also been a change in how they view the death penalty in California. So this is a person who, under the old laws, is a lying in wait, felony murder, looking at, you know, looking at possible life without parole, even possible death penalty with the aggravating circumstance of lying in wait, to now there's a possibility, like you pointed out, he could be convicted of nothing but a residential burglary, which is no... Nothing to sneeze at, but we're talking about a few years in prison as opposed to the rest of his life. Right. Yeah. And and that is re- so. Are you you guys are currently under a moratorium on the death penalty? Is that what's right. going on? Right. And, and so Illinois did that probably at, at this point about twenty years ago, and the like the moratorium never went away. So right. like like what what are what is California's like final destination with that are they looking to well, he's he the governor newsom has already said that he intends to dismantle death row so if, wow. yeah it's under a moratorium which you know we could have a whole episode on this but you know the the, <laughs> sure. the voters of california have several times have this come up on whether or not they still want the death penalty to be on the books and it's always been reaffirmed yeah. But he has taken it upon himself to not only put it into a moratorium, but now he's dismantling death row altogether. Wow. Yeah. In, in how, like, at the end of the day, you know, it, for, for the purposes of this case, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a factor. But, no. like, trying to figure that out, that lying and wait aspect of it, you know, but you have to presuppose if they get him on that aggravating factor of lying and wait, that means that they've clearly found that, he did kill her. Right. I mean, like right. that, like that has to be the end result in terms of what the jury came to. Yeah. I like, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see how that does apply. And, and like, I'm, I'm actively following that case through court TV and law and crime. So we, we're, we're following it pretty, pretty closely. So I'm going to be very curious to see how it shakes out with the jury. Cause like where I'm sitting on it right now, and I don't know if you've been watching the case much, I don't know. You know, like, I, I don't think that the state has, has met their burden thus far. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's a tough I, case, though. You, it you is know, a tough case. I saw some interesting testimony that when they arrived at the crime scene, there was like her necklace had been broken. There was like beads from her necklace all over the floor. And there was also a urine on the floor, which right. there's the argument that that could be, you know, one of the the effects of somebody having been strangled right um and so there is at least circumstantial evidence there's the a witness that says he heard a struggle so but again he could it, it but again it pushes the idea of will he have to take the stand to explain that yeah we got right. into a fight yeah we 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 struggled a bit but then i i i took my hands off of her and said, okay, fine, I'm going to leave. And she she ended up trying to run and jump off the... Por- I, I mean, who who knows if that is going to hold water with a jury, but you're right, it's not a slam dunk case. It's not. And, you know, but at the end of the day, my gut is, is that, that every single person on that jury are going to put themselves in the place of, of the victim and just for one moment sit there and think about how terrifying that would be. 100%. To walk into your home with that kind of invasion of privacy, and I, I, I just think it's going to be. I, I think it's going to end up in in the conviction on the murder, but not necessarily because of the evidence. I just yeah. think because of the totality of the circumstances, it's going to end up that you know it seems implausible that you came up there just to have a chat. You know? You're a man who dated a woman for less than a year, eight years prior. And right. you, you, by chance, we'll see how true that is, run into her at an event and are so obsessed that you decide to break into her home to have a chat with her. I, I think I agree with you. <laughs> the jurors on that jury are going to have a real time uh, handling all of that, that argument. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, we will watch that case, uh, keep a close eye on it. Let's turn to our final case out of Moscow, Idaho, where the judge presiding over the University of Idaho Slayings case is considering the presence of cameras in the courtroom as Brian Koberger's upcoming trial continues to generate public fervor. 
Koberger faces four counts of first-degree murder for the stabbing deaths of Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zaina Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, who were slain in their off-campus apartment. Prosecutors in Koberger's defense are surprisingly in agreement on this issue that the presence of cameras in the courtroom could negatively impact the trial, with the state alleging that the high-profile nature of the case could affect the, th the security of potential witnesses. Meanwhile, Koberger's defense is concerned about their client's due process rights, citing previous media coverage of the case in which cameras zoomed in on Koberger's facial expressions, despite a judge's instruction to not focus solely on the defendant. Media organizations have been vocal proponents for allowing cameras, arguing that the public has a right to transparency in the proceedings and that increased coverage could prevent public speculation or misinformation. The judge heard vocal arguments on the matter on September 13th and is set to make a ruling at an unspecified future date. Bob, I'm just going to let you jump in. What are, you, what are your thoughts about cameras in the courtroom generally and in this case in particular? Well, are you asking Bob Mata, the lawyer, or are you asking Bob Mata, the <laughs> podcaster? Because it's Both. two different answers. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from the criminal defense attorney side of it, uh, I just assume not have cameras in there. Um, if it's a high profile case, look, there is that balance of the First Amendment, the media's First Amendment right to be able to, you know, but like it, it to me as a criminal defense attorney, fifth fourth fifth and sixth are always they're my bible and you know in terms of the the defendant's right uh to a fair trial and in a case like this where the media and it's not just mainstream media it's social media it has been beyond anything that i've ever seen and and you know i'm no spring chicken i was around when oj was you know just like everywhere uh, it was appointment television, but we didn't have social media back then. And social media is an entirely different beast. And I worry, truthfully, about him being able to get an impartial, fair and impartial jury in there. I mean, it's just, it's a real thing. People, you know, and, and Joshua, we, we come up against it all the time. Like folks that don't, that don't practice law, that haven't tried cases, have a very hard time believing that that it's going to be that hard to find 12 people that haven't heard about the case and haven't formed an opinion on it, you know, and it, the reality is it is that hard in a case like this, you know, cause I like, I'll get in the debates constantly on Twitter where people are like, Oh, I just talked to three people the other day. They had no idea what the Idaho four case was. <laughs> and I'm like, man, like, uh, did they live in Idaho? Did they live in Moscow? Uh, you know, I mean, did they, it's, it's like, you have to look at it through the lens in which it needs to be looked through. And that's are the people of Idaho who would ultimately be seated in that jury box. Are they the ones, are they going to be able to find 12 people that are going to be able to be fair and impartial? And, and you know how it is. Like we, we've gone through when we're picking a jury and I'm trying to get a juror removed for cause because I don't want to use one of my challenges. And I've asked the question or the judge has asked the question, you know, have you heard about the case? Have you read publicity about the case? Have you seen or read or heard anything about the case? Juror sure says, yes. Okay. Well, have you formed an opinion on the case? And the juror says, you know, Pretty much, yes. I, I I think they're guilty. So then the judge has the opportunity to try to cure them. Okay. Yeah. And the judge will say, Okay, now I understand that you've answered those two questions affirmatively. What I'm going to ask you is despite that, do you have the ability to follow the law and to listen to the evidence and make your own judgment based on those two things alone without taking your whatever your prior bias or consideration was into effect? or into account. And if they say, yes, I can do that, the judge for the purposes of considering that juror cured, considers I'm cured. And so yeah. I'll lose my cause challenge. I'll have to use, I'll have to use one of my preemptory challenges and and to, to, to get that guy off. Because the reality is I don't believe, and I've been trying cases for 20 plus years that any juror that says that, really means it I, like and it's it's not a it's i think that we're human beings i think that when we form an opinion on something that it would take the moving of mountains or just 
absolutely smoking gun evidence to get that person to change their mind one way or another. That's just, that is human nature. I'm sure that you've debated people on social media and I have never, and I'm a very persuasive guy and I have never changed anybody's mind on social media ever. And it holds true in a court of law. Once people are dug into their position, they're stuck in it. You know, it, like, like in a rare circumstance, and when you're talking about a circumstantial case, and this is a circumstantial case, like they're, they're like the blood on the sheath is circumstantial. It's not direct evidence. Direct evidence is when you have an eyewitness or a video that sees the act occur. This is a wholly circumstantial case and people are going to have their opinions on this thing one way or another. So ultimately from the defense side of it, I think that it's probably the best bet that they do what they did with Vallo and just have it audio. And from the podcaster side of it, I want the thing televised. I want to see all of it, you know, cause the yeah. audio is sufficient Obviously, as observers of, of the, the case, we'd like to see the people on the stand. We like to be able to look at their body language. We want to be able to see how they're acting on the stand. We like those types of things help fill out a picture for us in terms of getting a total picture. But, you know, when you're balancing what's more important and, and you know, I realize that people are going to say, well, my interest in the case is more important than the defendant's, you know, Sixth Amendment right. <laughs> and, you know, I want to say, well, no, sorry, that's factually incorrect you know <laughs> so but it, it you know so but from the perspective of both sides making the argument the prosecutor is concerned about the safety of the you know both the witnesses and the jurors and obviously the defense is concerned about them being able to you know get a fair trial for the guy i mean because we're talking about two different time periods right joshua we're talking about pre-trial but we're also talking about trial i mean once yeah. the jury's impaneled i mean really the defense's concerns are gone yeah you know what i'm saying but the states aren't that's that's kind of where i wanted to push back on you about a little bit on first of all i i i have to uh add to your comment about the judge when they try to rehabilitate a juror and they say uh can you follow the law or follow my instructions and i agree with you it's so frustrating because you could have done such a great job of exposing all the biases that this person carries into the courtroom. And by the way, we're not trying to say that makes that person a bad person. That just not makes them all. not appropriate for that case. They just right. have some preconceived notions that they shouldn't sit on this type of a case. Fine, you're a great person, but you, this isn't the trial for you. Right. When you do a great job of exposing all of that and the judge goes, can you follow the law and my instructions? And they go, yes. And I've said this to judges before, who's going to say no to you, Your Honor? Ever. <laughs> Who is going to sit there in a group full of people with a judge with a robe sitting up on the bench there and go, no, I'm not going to follow the law and I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. Right. No one's going to say that. That does Ever. not rehabilitate that person. Right. So I completely agree with you on how frustrating, so frustrating. that is. It's such a frustrating thing. But I also, uh, to the point that you were just making, all of the um, all of the complaints, all of the concerns that the defense has about preconceived, the damage has been done. And by the way, cameras in the courtroom aren't going to undo it. If people have heard about this case, they have already heard about it. They've already per, uh, formed some sort of uh, preconceived notion about it. And if they're going to bring that in, they're going to bring that in and they're going to have to do a good job on voir dire. I agree with you. But but I think the point that I was going to get to and you were starting to get to is, okay, fine. The, we've mitigated what we can, but now that the trial started, why? what concerns arise by having some transparency of what took place in the courtroom? And before I let you get into it, the the think about the downsides of not having cameras because, by the way, just because you have, have no cameras doesn't mean everybody's going to forget about this case. You're still going to have a courtroom full of reporters who every time they take a break are going to rush out the door to get on their phones and report what's going on or step in front of a camera and report what's going on. And you're going to have all those different takes on what actually took place in court rather than live video of what we knew no took place in court you, you, yeah. you, do, do you follow me on this or where I do you come out you on that 100 <laughs> percent. and and you know and to like start off with that point of where you've got the reporters running out and and look you and i have been doing this for a long time i've, I've handled cases where 
it's like the accuracy of reporters and and I love them. Like this is I'm not trying to cast shade on reporters. However, short of them having attended law school, they just don't know what they're reporting on in terms of getting the intricacies correct. Like that's precisely yeah. what you're talking about. That is the advantage for the transparency for all of us to be able to accurately see what actually happened in court. You and I are going to have very different views than lay people in terms of what's happening in court just because of our educational background and because of our experience in practicing. You know, so that is a major factor in this. And, and I agree because to me, the way that, it shifts at trial. I think the defense no longer has a beef. I think at that point, which really seemed to be to be the the thrust of what the state was saying, is they were concerned about having the trial televised for the purposes of the witnesses being harassed yeah. and or threatened, and the jurors. You know, if God forbid, like in their eyes, they came back with a not guilty on the thing. They're they're very concerned. You know, so like those two things are are competing factors, but they're all kind of like ending up at the same place where both sides, which is unusual, frankly, that both sides came into that hearing wanting the cameras out of there. You yeah. know, and, and like I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in, well, in either office, either Ann Taylor's or John's, or, you know. And I like just it, think they know it makes life easier for them. I mean, that's way just, easier. That's just true. I mean, I've, I've had trials that were you got a camera in court every single day and it's just more difficult for you it because is. you've got to compete with all of that and then realizing that you're going to be scrutinized for everything that you did in court everything. that day so yeah i as far as they're concerned i can totally understand it from their very personal selfish perspectives i'm not calling them selfish but i understand why right. it makes life easier for them but i just feel i mean listen we are we are in the this is happening, folks. We are in the day and age of where everybody wants a camera somewhere to see what's happening. I think Idaho's taking itself maybe a little too seriously or overthinking this. We had the Murdoch case that had cameras every single day. Yeah. They had Johnny Depp and Amber Heard that took over the entire country, cameras every single day. They managed to pull pull both of those cases off. And I don't think there's an argument that the, the cameras fundamentally affected what took place. You could probably argue that it changed some people's behavior and everything else, but I don't think it fundamentally changed it to the point that there was a miscarriage of justice. And I just think that they there's a way to do it that, that addresses everybody's concerns. And I think that if they end up um, not having any camera, even a stationary camera in court, I think it would be a, a disservice to to people watching this and people concerned with how this case ends up. I agree completely. And I, I think, and what's different about this case in terms of it being televised as compared to anything else that we've seen in the past. And it's the thing that I'm always talking about in my podcast, man, like the real wars aren't the trial. It's the motion work that takes place going into trial because that is where the judge is deciding what's getting yeah. into evidence and what's not. And like for, the better part of our lives that has never been televised, you know? So this happens to be that case where they're televising all of it, where the motion work, which I've always said they should be televising because it's fascinating. Yeah. It's where the real battle is. And you're just seeing the culmination of it at trial, you know, like this is that situation. That's why I, I think if they, if they're going to, they're going to have to say, okay, look, I'm going to, if I were the judge, I'd say, I'm going to cut the cameras for the motion work as much as yeah. I don't want to. I think it should, but there's going to be trial, during the trial, there's going to be cameras. That's I, ironically, it. that would probably be the way to best preserve the integrity of the jurors and everything else. Is right. It's all this behind the scenes stuff that you're really concerned about people who might be sitting on the jury seeing. Yeah, right. that's a really, exactly. really good point. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're going to find out any day now uh, <laughs> how they f how they fall on that, and and whenever yeah. this comes to trial, which I I don't think will it be anytime soon, but we will Neither. continue to continue to watch it and keep our eyes on it and report back about it. But in the meantime, that's our show. Bob, thank you again so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you about your podcast? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm on I'm on TV quite a bit. Do court court TV, law and crime, news nation, wherever wherever they call me, wherever they beckon, I uh, I show up. Uh, but in terms of my pod, which is really my 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 real passion, my love, uh, you can find it anywhere you get your pods. It's called Defense Diaries. 
We've got a side pod called the Docket. Uh, unfortunately, Joshua, they're both on the same feed right now, which we're rectifying because people are getting confused. And, and right now on the Docket, and my wife is my co-host, who I said is my law partner and you know, obviously my partner in life as well. Uh, we are covering the Stephen Avery case and we're doing it like no one else has done it. So if you're interested in that case or if you're watching oh, yeah. convicting a murderer, our, we have no agenda. Both of us are going into it. We had both watched, obviously, uh, you know, making a murder. And, and I realized as soon as I watched it, I'm like, well, they forgot some stuff they had to. Well, there's no way they had a conviction on what they showed there. So the making of a murder, which is, is or convicting a murder, which is out now, they both have agendas. We're not doing that. We're going through the entire case. It's going to be a deep dive. So we're excited about it and we're fascinated about it. But that is on the docket. But Defense Diaries, anywhere you get your pods, that's the spot. Awesome. Yeah, I'm no I am fascinated on that everything. I will I will turn in because I know that I felt the same way watching that documentary. I'm like this. <laughs> the, I'm talking about the making the murder one. I'm like I thought they did a great job and I'm like, "Nah, none of this it, 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 some of this right. does not seem to be fitting together here." Uh holes. it does not Yeah, there's I feel like <laughs> we're not holes. getting the entire story. Yeah. But it was well, unbelievable. Like it was a yeah. Like, man, when it dropped and it was like it was around Christmas time, the kids were like out. We were all at home and man, I binged it and it was really, really well done. Oh, yeah. Oh, it yeah. Just, you know, it had highly slant. entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It was it, it, it geared more towards entertainment. And as we're finding out through the through the other one, the making a murder, convicting a murderer, there's clearly things they left out. But they're going to do the same thing. That's got yeah. a slant. That's got an agenda as well. We're. We're not doing either. We're giving everybody all the evidence. There you go. We're gonna go through if, all of it, and we're going to. If gonna you want that. the un unvarnished, unbiased take, tune in. That's uh, the spot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again. I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts, and we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address. Tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD Sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. <laughs>